So spraying isn't the only option. We try to do a lot of different things so that we're not completely relying on spraying to manage our insect populations. What's up Lazy Dog fam? Hope everybody out there is having a wonderful day. Today on the homestead, we're gonna revisit something we talked about a little bit when we planted these cucumbers here. We got two different varieties planted and we thought there might be some issues based on the type of cucumbers that we have planted in close proximity to one another. So we're gonna readdress that issue and see if we're noticing any of those things that we thought might could be a problem. Then we're gonna talk about our pest control here on our homestead at Lazy Dog Farm. We've had a lot of people requesting us talk about what we're spraying, how often we're spraying, how we're dealing with pests. So we're gonna talk about the most common pests we deal with here and how we manage those pest issues. So let's start off with our cucumbers here, which I need to pick in just a minute. Been having to pick these every other day. They're making a lot of fruits for us. So on this side we have a variety called Corinto. It's a slicing cucumber. And you can see the plants are really vigorous. It's been a really good producer for us. Now this is a Parthenocarpic variety, which means it doesn't require any pollination to produce fruits. Contrast that with our pickling variety down here, the Supremo variety. Now the plants don't look near as vigorous as those Corinto plants over there, but we've been getting a good amount of cucumbers off this little short row right here. But this Supremo variety is more of a standard cucumber variety. It's a hybrid variety, but it produces male and female flowers, so it does require pollination. So before we go any further, let me go ahead and harvest both of these varieties. I'll keep the fruit separate, and then we'll talk about if we're seeing any issues having this Parthenocarpic variety planted so close to this standard variety that needs pollination. All right, so there's our harvest. We've got our Supremo pickling cukes right there, and this is our Corinto slicing cukes right there. Now, as you can see from our harvest there and the health of these plants, both these varieties are doing pretty well for us. We've grown Supremo before, so we kind of knew what to expect there, and it's performing good as usual. We've never grown Corinto before, but I'm very impressed by this variety. When we decided we were gonna grow this one, when we were picking our seed choices for this year, I told y'all that these seeds were pretty pricey and it was gonna be interesting to see if they were actually worth it. And I think they are. I think this is the most productive variety I've ever grown. And I've grown a lot of different slicing cucumber varieties man these things right here just produce and produce and produce you could pick them every single day if you wanted to i'm a member of several market farming groups on facebook and those guys had always talked about growing corinto and i always wondered why are they so high on this variety why do they like it so much well now i see if you were a market farmer this would be the way to go because you're going to maximize your profit you know per row length growing a really productive variety like this that doesn't require pollination. Now it is documented by reputable sources online that if you grow a standard cucumber variety, meaning male and female flowers, got to have pollination nearby a parthenocarpic cucumber variety that doesn't require pollination, that you can have some issues in that these parthenocarpic cucumbers won't necessarily be true to variety. Now these Corinto cucumbers are usually grown inside a greenhouse in an isolated environment, so there's no cross-pollination with any other cucumber varieties. But it is recommended that if you grow these outside that you isolate them from any other varieties, otherwise the fruits might not be true. However, I haven't found that to be the case, at least yet. So some of the reports say that the fruits can be misshapen if they're cross-pollinated with other varieties. All kinds of issues there, but we haven't had any issues so far. A few of the fruits are curved, but most of them are pretty straight, pretty perfect looking, just like these. And one of the other issues that they say can arise when growing Parthenocarpic cucumbers next to other varieties is the seeds and size. So what makes these Parthenocarpic cucumbers so desirable on the market is that they have either no seeds or really, really tiny seeds in there. Now some people are bothered by big cucumber seeds. It doesn't really bother me, but that's why a lot of people like this variety. 
and they say that if it gets cross pollinated then it'll have a bunch of seeds in it a bunch of big seeds in it now i don't know if you can see the center of that both of those cucumbers there there are some tiny little bitty seeds in there but nothing like a standard cucumber variety so we haven't had any issues with the shape or the presence of large seeds in these now i don't know why i'm sure those issues do occur on some scale but we haven't noticed it here in our little cucumber plot so if you were worried about that growing a parthena carpet next to another variety i would say don't worry about it a whole lot we haven't seen anything yet that's not to say it can't or it will not happen but hopefully that eases some of your fears if you were worried about growing two different varieties side by side so now let's talk about bugs in the garden or insect pests that we deal with around here and this will be specific to warm season vegetables or what we have growing right now so first let's kind of talk about the pests that we struggle with the most what we deal with around here and then we'll talk about our plan for kind of managing or mitigating the damage from those pests so first let's talk about corn which doesn't give us a whole lot of pest issues usually as it's growing but once it starts producing those beautiful ears of corn that's when we can have some problems with that corn earworm now unlike some other pests that we deal with on other vegetables the corn earworm won't completely ruin the corn it will ruin the top part of the cob there if you're selling the corn it's probably hard to sell corn with worms in it a lot of times you can just cut the top part of that ear off eat the rest of the corn and be just fine but we try not to have worms in our corn if we can help it most of the time you don't see any earworm damage until you have cobs there and those worms are feeding on those kernels but sometimes especially as things get hotter late spring into summer we'll start to see damage on the leaves we know that's earworms and we need to start treating then if we don't see any damage on the leaves we'll usually wait until silks start appearing and then we'll just spray the silks that way we don't have any worms now let's talk about summer squash so this would include our yellow squash zucchini we'll even lump pumpkins into this category as well so on squash, zucchini, and pumpkins, our main two pest issues are going to be squash bugs and pickle worms. Now for some reason, we don't have issues with squash vine borers down here. I don't really know why. I don't know if it's because of something we do in our gardens, you know, our rotation plan or whatever, or if they're just not bad down here. I don't really know why we don't have issues with them, but we just don't. But we have significant issues with the squash bugs and the pickle worms, and they get worse as things get warmer. The squash bugs will just kind of suck the sap out of the plants, and then those pickle worms are gonna bore holes into the fruits there, and nobody wants to eat a squash that's got worms all in it. And with the cucumbers, we get a few squash bugs on these, but our main issue is the pickle worms. They seem to target the cucumbers more than they do the squash. So we gotta be careful. We gotta watch out for those pickle worms or else they'll eat every single cucumber we got. And moving on to another crop that can give us a good bit of pest issues, and that would be tomatoes. So the two main pests we have on tomatoes would be the tomato hornworm and then the leaf footed bug. We'll start with the tomato hornworm. So these are the big green worms that chew holes in your tomatoes. And these are pretty easy to control. A lot of folks will just come out at night, you know, walk around with a flashlight and hand pick them off their tomato plants. They're also pretty easy to control with some organic pesticides. So we don't worry about those a whole lot. We see one every now and then, but our regular spray program pretty much takes care of those with these. Now the leaf-footed bugs are another story. Whereas the tomato hornworm, it's pretty easy to manage. The leaf-footed bugs are not always that easy. Now a lot of people will confuse these with stink bugs and they're related, but the leaf-footed bug is pretty easy to identify, especially as an adult, because it has these little leaf-like projections on its legs. And what these guys do is they will feed on your tomatoes as they're ripening and cause some severe discoloration there. So a tomato that would normally be red when it was ripe 
has all these kind of yellow splotches all over it and that's from the leaf footed bug kind of sucking on that ripe tomato now these little guys are easy to kill when they're small when they're in the nymph stage but when they become mature adults they're almost impossible to kill with organic methods so the best strategy here is just to have a regular spraying program and try to keep those nymphs from growing into mature adults because if you get a full-blown population of mature adults they can really do some damage and then the last crop we'll talk about that gives us some significant pest issues would be our field peas here so our field peas, our southern peas, our cow peas, whatever you want to call them, give us two pest problems primarily. We're going to have some aphids on them, we know that, but aphids are pretty easy to control with a wide range of products, even a wide range of organic products. But the big one that gives us a lot of trouble is the pea curculio, or the pea weevil, and organic methods don't really work on it. So this is the one crop where I use a synthetic product. We use Liquid 7 because that's the only thing I've found to work on that pea curculio. It basically feeds on those pea pods and sucks on those peas as they're maturing and you end up with peas with little stings all over them and nobody wants to eat peas that are all stung up. So those are the crops and the accompanying pests that we deal with most here at our gardens in Zone 8B in South Georgia. And every garden is different. You may deal with some of the same pests. You may have a completely different set of pests that give you trouble. And it can be really localized. Folks that live in town seven miles away may deal with a completely different set of pests than we deal with out here in big ag country. So, you know, you just kind of have to realize what you're having problems with and then address it that way. So how do we address it? Well, we like to use what is called an IPM or an integrated pest management strategy. So spraying isn't the only option. We try to do a lot of different things so that we're not completely relying on spraying to manage our insect populations. So part of that IPM for us would be crop rotation. We're rotating things around. We try not to plant the same family of vegetables in the same plot year after year. And that's gonna help with our pest pressure a good bit. We also plant a lot of cover crops in the summertime. When it gets too hot to really grow anything, we start focusing on cover crops. And what those do is they help break those pest cycles. So if you're always giving those pests something to feed on, they're gonna keep reproducing, keep multiplying, and that problem is gonna get worse year after year. But we take a break from the vegetables, plant some cover crops, it breaks those pest reproduction cycles, and our problem is not multiplied year after year, like I said. Also, some of those cover crops have some kind of natural pest deterrent properties with them, like the mustard, for example, that we always plant before we plant our potatoes. We don't spray our potatoes with anything. We don't really have any pest issues on our potatoes, and I attribute that mostly to that mustard cover crop. And then hand removal is always an option. If you've got a small scale garden, just a few plants, you can go out there and pick the pests off by hand, squish them in your fingers or dip them in a bucket of water, however you prefer to kill them. You can do that on a small scale. Here with 10 plots, it'd be really hard for me to manage my pest populations just by you know, hand removing all the bugs I see. Now, if I do see some, I will grab them and squish them, but there's no way I can do that enough. I'd be out here all day and I probably still wouldn't get them all. And then we have the spraying. So we do spray our plants mostly in the warmer months. I found that in the cooler months, in the fall and winter garden, we can get away with spraying maybe once a month. We don't have to spray that often, but this time of year, it's at least every two weeks, if not every week. And I'm about to show you what we've been using in our gardens. But a lot of people like to make up their own products at home. A lot of people swear by the Blue Dawn dish soap. And if that works for you, that's great. Now, I have tried that at varying concentrations. You know, the Blue Dawn dish soap 
in a little spray bottle and I've sprayed it on leaf-footed bugs, squash bugs, and for some reason it doesn't seem to phase them down here. I don't know if we have a different strain or whatever, but it just doesn't phase them. And if we get a full-blown population of either of those pests this year, hopefully I can get some video footage and I'll show you guys how I spray them with that and they just laugh at me. But if that works for you, that's great. But let me talk about the products I've been using and how well they're working for me. So the main two I've been using this year, and both of these are organic, would be this Azera right here and then this Spinosad right here. And right now I've been spraying once every two weeks and I've been alternating these. So one week I'll spray this, two weeks later I'll spray this. It may get to the point where we're doing it weekly, but right now once every two weeks seems to be enough. Now this Azera here is not cheap, but I have found that requires less frequent applications than other organic insecticides out there. And so you end up spending just as more on a cheaper product because you're having to apply it more often. So you get a lot of bang for your buck with this stuff. Now this stuff contains pyrethrins, which are naturally derived from the chrysanthemum plant. And this kills a very broad range of garden pests, worms, flying insects, sucking insects, all kind of stuff. And I've really been pleased with this. I think it mixes at the rate of two ounces per gallon. But really, really been pleased with this. Like I said, it's not cheap, but if you have a larger garden, I have found it is certainly worth it. Then we have our Spinosad here, which also has some pretty broad knockdown power. It's gonna kill worms and some of those sucking insects as well. This is your main product if you have some corn earworm issues this is your go-to i've got where i don't use a lot of bt or hardly any bt because both of these will do what bt does and more now because these have such broad spectrum knockdown power you want to make sure you spray these late in the evening don't spray these during pollinating hours so a lot of times i'll come out here right at dark or after dark we have a big kind of street light in the middle of our backyard here which provides plenty of light for me to see and i'll spray you know after it turns dark now although both of these organic insecticides here are pretty effective they're not going to completely eradicate any of our problems eradication should never be your goal because it's pretty much not possible all we're doing is trying to manage the populations, keep the populations at a minimum so we can get our harvest in, we can enjoy our vegetables in the spring, the late spring and early summer before it gets too hot and the heat zaps all the plants. So all we're doing is trying to manage the populations here. We're never gonna completely remove any pests that we have in our gardens. So we have those two organic options and we rotate those every two weeks, as I told you. And then we have that P. curculio that's a booger for us. And that's where we use this stuff right here. And you can find this anywhere. You can find it on Amazon. I'll put a link below. You can find it Lowe's, Home Depot, pretty much anywhere. This is not the greatest stuff for pollinators. I don't like using it, but I have to use it if we want to have field peas. I've tried numerous, numerous times to grow field peas with organic insecticides, and it just can't do it down here. So this is a necessary evil for us. If you want to unsubscribe because we use this, I completely understand. But if we want field peas in the freezer, this is the only way for us to make that happen. Now, we haven't been talking about plant diseases in this video. We've just been talking about insect problems. But I should mention there's something else I mix when I'm spraying either that Azera or the Spinosad. I don't mix anything with the 7. But if I'm doing the Azera or the Spinosad, I do mix an organic disease control with it as well. Now, this Liquicop is not registered organic, but it might as well be. It's really not harmful to anything. So I'll mix either this complete disease control or this copper with the Azera or the Spinosad. I can't really remember what rotation I'm on as far as if I'm putting this I think I'm putting this with the Spinosad and this with the Azera lately. I can't really remember. I've got it written down somewhere. But you can mix either one of these with either the Spinosad or the Azera and be fine. And this gives us some nice disease control as well. And as I've told you before, when you're using organic insecticides or fungicides, coverage is key. You want to cover the entire plant as much as possible. Get 
all in those nooks and crannies cover the entire leaf front and back if you can that's not always possible especially if we end up with big plants and really dense plantings of stuff but we try to get as much coverage as possible because that's going to make the products we spray more effective now lately we've had several viewers mention that they're now using a fogger to apply their insecticides and fungicides and i think that is great that's probably the most effective way to apply them the more fine a mist you can broadcast the better coverage you're going to get on the plants but sometimes those foggers are a little bit pricey so that's not in everybody's budget or that doesn't really work with everybody's scale i would eventually like to have a fogger but let me show you what we use currently so with the size of our garden having 10 plots a uh, hand pump sprayer doesn't work that well for us because we have to fill it up so many times so instead I use a backpack sprayer like this and I can put four gallons in this one and that's usually enough to spray all my plots that need spraying so I got this unit here off Amazon we using it for several months and you can find backpack sprayers that cost several hundred dollars or you can find some a little cheaper than this we kind of went middle of the road but I've really been liking this one so far I really like the padded support here on the backpack portion of it wraps around your waist there it's really comfortable to wear even with four gallons in it completely full and then the spray wand here came with a bunch of different nozzles the one i've got on there gives me the finest mist i can get and so i've been really happy with this one so far so if you're in the market for a good backpack sprayer that won't break the bank you might want to give this one a try there are a lot of different options out there if you have a big garden like we do i think a backpack sprayer is much more handy than a hand pump sprayer so i know that was probably a lot to digest there but hopefully that gave you some good insight as to how we manage things around here we're never going to get rid of all of our pests but we try to manage them as best we can spraying isn't the only option we do lots of other things to try to mitigate the pest issues but we do have to spray certain times of the year just to be able to salvage the vegetables that our plants are producing so they don't get completely ruined by the bugs and let me know in the comments below what are the kind of ipm strategies that you use in your garden or on your homestead what are you spraying if you're spraying anything and then what other methods or strategies are you using as far as rotation cover cropping hand removal anything like that if you're watching on youtube i'll put links below to all the products i showed you in this video so you can grab some of those if you think they'd be helpful for your garden also go check out our website lazydogfarm.com where we've got some hats shirts our garden blog recipes all kind of good stuff over there and if you did enjoy this video make sure to subscribe hit that notification button like and share and we'll see you next time right here at lazy dog farm Of your life